Hey, everybody. Welcome to Roll Back. What is Roll Back? Well, Roll Back is essentially my way of introducing awesome, evergreen episodes from the prehistoric, pre video days of the podcast to YouTube for the first time. These are powerful and enlightening conversations that I really think deserve a second life here on YouTube. And my interview with Michelle McMacken, MD, is one prime example. Board certified in internal medicine, Dr. McMacken is the executive director of nutrition and lifestyle medicine for New York City Health and Hospitals. And she specializes in plant-based nutrition specifically. What is perhaps uniquely inspiring about Dr. McMacken is her commitment to studying evidence-based nutritional protocols and then applying that practical knowledge to faculty, to colleagues, and resident doctors. So in other words, she's of course devoted to educating her patients, but also to her fellow medical professionals about healthy plant-based nutrition, filling this very much needed gap in our current system of medical education. The bottom line is this, we need more doctors like Dr. McMacken, and I'm just delighted to share our exchange with you today. This is a highly informative conversation. I really hope you enjoy it. From episode 162, recorded way back in 2015, this is me and Dr. Michelle McMacken. So I work at Bellevue Hospital, I don't know if you yeah. or your listeners are familiar with it. Well, but. all I know about Bellevue is like that was the insane asylum. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so That's usually you have the this first <laughs> conjured image of like Bellevue where they lock you up, right? Yeah, that's usually the first um, thing people think of. So I have to spend time kind of dispelling that. Yeah, disabuse right off the me bat. of this uh, idea of the Iron Gate. Yeah, so um, Bellevue is uh, it's actually the nation's oldest continuously operating hospital and it's mm. also the oldest public hospital so it's wow. how old like when like 17 really? something oh, wow yeah is there is the original structure still yeah. wow yeah yeah um so and you know i think the key things to know about it are it's an extremely mission oriented place so in being a safety net hospital we basically take care of everybody regardless mm -hmm. of ability to pay mm -hmm. right and um and the people that that kind of hospital attracts, like the the doctors and the nurses and the other staff that it tra attracts, are people that I feel like I have a lot in common with. So like serve more service oriented. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's right in. It's like on the east side, isn't it? It's on Twenty like Seventh and First. Right. Uh huh. And so it's it's so my practice is it's a primary care practice. I'm trained in internal medicine, which is basically like, um, you know, you're the person that. Um, takes care of sort of everything. So mm -hmm. you're taking care of the whole body. You're taking care of all the organ systems, mental health, you know, so like a lot of social stuff. You're kind of the quarterback of like the healthcare team. Right, right, right. So do you have a like a private practice outside of the hospital or no. is your, off, your office is in the hospital? All Bellevue but it's all not the like, time. So if somebody comes to see you, is it like uh, like an acute situation, like an ER situation, or because you just, or, I mean, it's not usual for somebody to book an appointment and go to a hospital to see a doctor, right? So, um, so there's a very large ambulatory care practice as part of Bellevue Hospital. So we're it's a regular doctor's office. Mm -hmm. um, there's internal medicine, there's OBGYN, there's all the medical specialties, surgical specialties. Um, so. Basically, coming to see me is like going to see it, like any visit to the doctor. Right. You're just like a, your general practitioner sort right. of situation. Right. Uh -huh. Right. So I take care of adults only. That's internal medicine. And um, and yeah, I mean, I basically take care of people from all walks of life. So, you know, I'll have most of my most of my practice is actually Spanish speaking because I mm -hmm. speak Spanish. And um but it, it really a day doesn't go by where I'm not on the interpreter phone in like Tibetan or West African dialect or Chinese dialect, French, Polish. So wow. it's an extremely diverse uh, patient population. And um, in terms of education and literacy, there's a huge amount of diversity as well. Uh -huh. um, but in general, I would imagine kind of lower on the socioeconomic 
scale, right? I think that's, you know, there, we have people from, you know, coming from all walks of life, but yeah, I mean, most of my patients have either no insurance at all or mm-hmm. are, have a government sponsored insurance like Medicaid. Mm-hmm. And if somebody comes in with no insurance, there's no, you still treat, you, you still treat them. And then that's what know, we're there right, for. Right. right. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Uh-huh. So everybody gets basically state of the art care. Like they have this access to hundred percent of the same services you'd have anywhere. Uh-huh. And the, are they afraid they're going to get locked up in the loony bin, <laughs> out of the room, <laughs> get in the straight jacket? I, I, they don't express that to me, <laughs> but <laughs> does that aspect of the hospital still exist though? Like, or well, is that just some a... kind of wives tale or, I mean, that, that must yeah. be rooted in some kind of reality back in the day. Yeah. I mean, it has, I think Bellevue, I don't want to misquote, but I think Bellevue has one of the largest number of inpatient um, psychiatric beds. And uh-huh. so it has a long tradition of, treating mental health right. um, issues. But like that was what it kind of originally yeah. made its name yeah. doing, right? But like, you know, Bellevue is um, also, also a leader in, you know, TB back in the day, tuberculosis. And even mm-hmm. now, like in the 90s when TB came back, um, Ebola, you know, mm-hmm. we've done amazing things with treating Ebola patients. Wow, or, that's interesting. So so was that, was Bellevue kind of front and center when that recent sort of scenario Very arose? front and center. Wow, so what was that, that like? That was us. That must have been pretty, you know, interesting and heightened. Yeah, it was intense. I think there was a lot of, um, there was a tremendous amount of fear, obviously, around it. And um, you'd hear things, I mean, just even being in New York, like you'd hear, you'd overhear conversations on the subway about, oh, you know, this person who had Ebola was in the bowling alley in Brooklyn, and right. I was there the day before. And right, right, there's just right. wide panic. The guy was panic. a doctor, right? Was mm-hmm. he a doctor at Bellevue? Mm-hmm. No, I remember that story. Yeah, wow. Yeah, but we uh, we treated him, and it was a huge success, obviously. And uh-huh. now we're sort of a flagship hospital for future potential future Ebola cases. So, so were there like medical practitioners walking around in hazmat suits in the hospital and stuff, or is that like a like a closed off? It was wing, a very or very yeah very closed off, uh-huh. very controlled situation, extremely well thought out. Right. Um, because obviously the consequences are. Mm-hmm. of not thinking it out well are pretty strong. Right. So. so how did you end up at Bellevue? Like, where did you go to medical school and what kind of led you into, you know, towards your path? Yeah, so um, I went to med school at Columbia here in mm-hmm. New York. And uh, then I trained, you know, it's kind of at during med school, I actually originally set out to do public health work. And then um, pretty early on in my training, realized I wanted to... Uh, essentially like treat asthma in the Bronx, like do very basic primary care for people Mm -hmm. who otherwise may not have it. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt like I could probably have the most impact that way. And it used my own skill set the best. Um, And so I went into training in internal medicine. I trained at Cornell, actually. Uh Um, Cornell here in in the city. In Manhattan. Yeah. 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 Well, Cornell Medical Center. And then... uh, Graduating from residency or finishing residency, I uh, looking for a job. I knew I wanted to be at an academic center. Basically, you know, for me, it was like the mission of service, but also the mission of teaching. Mm-hmm. So Bellevue was a really perfect fit because obviously the mission of service. And then um, Bellevue is a teaching hospital for NYU. So right. my typical week looks like, you know, Half the time I'm seeing patients in the office, and then the other half the time I'm teaching. I'm basically residents or doctors in training are coming to me. They're seeing patients, and they're presenting you know, their plan or their assessment to me, and I'm giving them feedback. So right, right, right. Supervising. And I get, yeah, I want to get into all of that, but like just sort of sticking with the, the evolution of mm-hmm. Dr. McMacken. <laughs> Um, my only point of reference is is law school, and I know from my experience in law school that you know, sort of when you when you enter law school, there's a lot of people who are kind of service oriented, and they're like, I'm going to go work for this nonprofit or you know this pro bono you know organization or something like that, and then you know by year three, everybody's shipping <laughs> off to be associates at at big prominent law firms with big you know sort of salaries and. And the rationale is generally like, I'm in so much debt, you know, I, I'm just right. going to go do this for a couple of years and then I'm going to go do, you know, what makes my heart beat. And more often than not, that, you know, so, sort of doesn't happen. You know, you get stuck in, into that lifestyle. I mean, is that similar? Is it similar in medical school? I mean, do you see that kind of attrition? Yeah, I think, well, I, I mean, you brought up the debt issue and I think that's a real, it's a very real driver of a lot of people's choices. Um, in terms of what they specialize in and how they formulate their practice. 
Um, and it probably should have been an issue for me, but I just, mm. I just said, you, you know, I just went guns. straight to the, what made my heart Right. Like, and you know. where, where does that come from? I mean, is that, did your parents raise you well? Or, you know, like, how does it, how do <laughs> they you- They definitely did. You know, where does the kind of compulsion to, to be in service derive from, if you had to articulate that? Yeah, I mean, um, I'd like to say it's, you know, it's like I'm born with a noble impulse, but really I just feel like, you know, you can be in service in a lot of different ways, right? I mean, you can be um, within medicine and it, you don't have to have a practice at- a hospital that serves the underserved to be in service of others, mm-hmm. of course. Um, well, by its very nature, it's a, you're in service just by being a doctor. Right, right. And um, But I think for me, there's something about um, being, in, being the person that has the opportunity to offer something where no, where maybe someone else wouldn't have the chance, you know, they wouldn't have mm-hmm. the chance to get that. So for example, a lot of my patients, I'm, you know, I'm the first doctor that has ever sort of called them back with their lab results, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, that sounds crazy, right? I mean, you go yeah. to the doctor and don't you expect a call saying, right. you know, like your blood work was good or this is a problem. And so time after time, when I call my patients back with their lab results, they're like, you're the best doctor ever. Mm-hmm. I can't believe you called me. And I just think <laughs> like that- doing the thing that you're kind of supposed to <laughs> right, do. Right, And so I, I guess what I'm getting at is um, it feels really good to be to be offering that to people. I mean, mm-hmm. people deserve that, right? People deserve that kind of relationship. And um, and I'm also, it's just, a, it's just a great platform to educate people about things that are really important to their health and to me, mm-hmm. um, which I know we'll get into. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's kind of a, you know, systemic problem when it comes to just basic patient care and palliative care, right? Like, like just general rules of human decency, you know, seem to get cast aside. And I don't know whether that's because, you know, it's a numbers game and you're just seeing so many patients or, or what kind of happens, but, you know, the typical patient experience is not always so positive, particularly when it comes to, you know, sort of bedside manners and all of that. Yeah, I think, um, and we'll probably get into this, but I think um, the system is broken in a lot of ways, and the system doesn't really allow us as physicians to interact with patients, I think, the way we probably should. Mm -hmm. And, you know, know, it takes time to... It takes time to deliver individualized care and to call people back with their lab results. Mm -hmm. And yet time, there's no reimbursement for that. And so therefore time isn't carved out for that. Mm -hmm. And that's understandable at the hospital level or, you know, and it's not just our hospital, it's every medical system um, for the most part. Right. I think it's, you know, easy to just say, oh, well, you know, they're selfish or there's some kind of God complex with doctors. But I think when you really look at the system and what's driving it and what's pushing them, like they're just trying to like get through the day. You know, know, they're good people. It's like you, you have to be you know, of a certain mindset to even get into this to begin with. So right. that's why, you know, I said it's systemic, I think. I think it's just the structure within, you know, the rules that apply to practicing don't really necessarily provide for that. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. Cool. So, um, all right. So you're at Bellevue, but at the same time, you're a professor, right? At NYU. Assistant yeah, assistant professor. professor. <laughs> well, come on. You, we can call Thank, you professor. Thanks for the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> That's just semantics. <laughs> You're a college professor or a medical school professor. Medi- school of medicine, right. yeah. So, yeah. And, and so tell me what you teach at NYU. So most of my teaching goes on at the level of the residency. So um, those are, so basically people that have graduated from medical school, so the fully fledged doctors, but um, who are in their training program. Mm-hmm. And um, some of it is didactic. But the vast majority majority of it is really just hands-on, clinical, day-to-day, how do you take care of patients. Right. Um, so you're walking these, like, new doctors through the kind of daily routine of what it means to be a resident. Yeah, and you're just, you're watching, you're watching what they do with a eagle eye. Mm-hmm. You are ultimately the one responsible for the care that they're delivering. So you are, you're, you're trying to help them learn and yet make it a beneficial situation for the patient, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you're balancing practicing medicine with assistant professor duties. I mean, that's a, that's a lot, right? So, I mean, what's a, what's a typical day or a typical week look like? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's direct patient care. So me sitting down in my office, in my exam room, and seeing patients for half a day. Um, and then in the afternoon, for example, I would then move to a larger area where residents or doctors in training come to me and mm-hmm. present cases. Um, in other words, they'll they'll see a patient, they'll come up with their own assessment, they'll present the whole situation to me, and I'll say, hey, that, you know, I think you're you're on target here. Right. Like I like a, your plan. Like, kind of like a Dr. House kind of yeah. review. <laughs> only, only there's very, there's, there's not as many mysteries. It's not quite <laughs> yeah. that exciting. Um, there's definitely some mysteries. But that's in the same hot. So you're in the same hot. Yeah. You're not going to NYU, oh, no. like a different building. I got same, you. same exact area. Uh huh. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so yeah, like I said, I mean, most of the, most of the time it's a, ha- a very hands-on practice. Um, and there's, there is didactic stuff, but it's mostly just hands-on. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. Guiding people, and uh, and so let's get into kind of the plant based yeah. slant, uh, Good. <laughs> where you're coming from. I mean, where did you know what's the origin story there? Like, how did you get interested in plant based nutrition, and you know where did that begin? Yeah, I mean, looking back, I mean, I think it really there's almost like two parallel roads. Um, that I've been on that it didn't really converge until fairly recently. So um, the professional story, which is a little bit less interesting, um, we've kind of already gone through some of it, but, you know, I um, I went to college. I was an English major, English literature major. Mm-hmm. Um, graduated at the height of the recession in the 90s, like did odd jobs, worked at a used bookstore, um, eventually. So you didn't know the doctor thing wasn't? no. Part of the that was not experience. not at all. You weren't like a driven type A pre med person. I was a driven type A person, but not pre med. But not pre med. Yeah. Interesting. I mean i I took a semester of chemistry in college because my dad's a biochemist, and I felt like I've got to just honor that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and my mom is too, yeah. so I felt like it's. Maybe, How did you do? I actually did well, but then I I didn't take the whole year. I just was like, you know, I've done it. I proved that I can take a half a science class mm-hmm. and excel at it. And but I'm I'm, gonna, a, I'm a liberal arts person. Yeah, I'm a humanities yeah. person. I love, you know, I love novels. I love the story. Um, but then graduation happened, and I was like, oh, whoops, you know, I need a job. Like what? Mm-hmm. So, um, eventually. Um, I lived in Atlanta at the time after graduation, and I eventually just stumbled on a job at the Centers for Disease Control down there as a writer editor. And uh, I worked there for about three years in my early twenties, and that was that was the experience that got like the gears turning around going to med school. And yet, I still had not taken a science class. Right. Interesting. So, so at CDC, I mean, that must have been like that's a crazy place. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's an intense place. Um, well, it's like a cross between intensity and like government, you know, mm-hmm. the government Bureaucracy. environment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, people do amazing stuff. They go out on outbreaks. I mean, they're the folks that are dealing with right. Ebola, like we were talking about before and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it was pretty inspiring. And that's where I thought, you know, hey, you know, this is completely unexpected, but maybe I should consider getting involved and mm-hmm. knowing that that kind of decision was a, at least a 10-year commitment. Mm-hmm. And I was already at that point, whatever. Right, and you hadn't, 25. you hadn't taken all the prerequisites in college, right, right? for med school. No, so I, how did you have to, you had to go back and kind of do that, right? Yeah, I did I did a post-baccalaureate pre-med program. Mm-hmm. And um, those programs are great because you're surrounded. It's like you and 24 other humanities majors who made this decision? Who are all questioning <laughs> yeah. exactly like what am I doing? I can't right. believe you know I'm doing this. And um, the one I went to at um, in Goucher College in Baltimore was great because you took every pre med prerequisite in one year, uh-huh. like wow, chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, and biology, all in one year. Uh-huh. And uh, it's like That's, I like to, it's like ripping off a band aid. Like yeah. just get it over with. Right. That's intense. And yet I loved it. I didn't. I you know. I actually found out that I was really good at science, mm. and um, my parents were pretty proud. Yeah, I was going to say your dad must have been <laughs> happy, right? Yeah, he was, oh, I finally understood what he did. Yeah. And I could finally understand, like, his publications, uh-huh. you know, not completely. So but. He's, he's like a lab scientist? He's an academic biochemist, yeah. Mm-hmm. So he does, um, he does a lot of work with um, 
gene replication, mm-hmm. DNA replication. Right, and and here you are uh, expressing, uh, yeah, <laughs> expressing. <laughs> it all this, comes out. Yeah, this recessive gene that now is coming to coming to be expressed. Right. Well, my mom has it too. So yeah, yeah. She's a scientist as yeah. well. Yeah, she's a biochemist. Oh, okay. That's so how they this met. Was, this was inevitable. No doctors. No doctors <laughs> no. in the family. <laughs> um, so yeah. So then I, you know, I finished up that program and I moved to New York. Um, Got a you know a great like one year position in, at the Department of Health um, as a health educator here in mm-hmm. New York, and then that year I applied to med school. And within about a week of moving to New York, I realized I was never going to leave. Mm-hmm. Like just love, love it, you love it, here. love it here. Yeah. So um, enrolled at Columbia, and um, I like how you just said you just enrolled. Just, 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 enrolled. just enrolled. Yeah, because I just decided to. Yeah. Well, it's interesting looking back on your resume, like even though you had this, you know, humanities background <clears throat> with the CDC and then working in public health in New York and then having all the prerequisites. I mean, that's a pretty solid basis to get into a good med school. Yeah, and Columbia was great because there were a lot of other postbacks there too. So it felt like a community and it felt, um, I think there's something about there's a lot of things about being a humanities major and going to med school and, and starting med school at the age of 27, mm-hmm. which to me now sounds young. But at that time, you know, you're whatever, you're six years older than everybody else, yeah. which is a big difference at that time in your life. Um, but I think for me, being a humanities major really kept me on my edge because I always thought, you know, how am I going to compete as far as like passing tests and with people that were you know, molecular biology majors. Mm-hmm. And um, the first couple of years were, you know, I, I, I did well, but it was, I really put a lot of work in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then towards the clinical years, which are the third and fourth years of med school, where you actually start talking to patients, um, that's where everything just kind of like blew up in a great way. Like I was like, this has really been the right decision. And or, Yeah, you just realize like, this is what you're made to do. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, so that's sort of the, we kind of covered the, the resin, professional, the resin yeah. <laughs> how we got here. Yeah. How we got here. Um, and then I think the personal story, you know, just leading up to, to where I am now, as far as nutrition and plant-based, you know, plant-based eating, you know, I think I'm, I'm one of those people who probably like a lot of, you know, a lot of people or kids are sort of don't have the, um, for, it seems a little strange to make a distinction between, you know, the food on our plate and the animals that we see, right? Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of like one of those people that never lost, like that just kind of it seemed a little bit strange, like that the food on my plate used to be an animal that was running around. I never kind of lost that sense that it was weird. Mm-hmm. And But you weren't like somebody who was like, you know, a vegan animal rights activist in high school or something. No, I, I became a vegetarian at a really young age, like 13, um, mostly because it just intuitively felt like I just couldn't imagine that I was eating the food that, you know, like I was eating an actual right. being that used to run around. It just didn't seem, it just didn't seem right. And it didn't, um, it just didn't resonate with me. So I was a vegetarian for, a, I've been a vegetarian for a very long time. And I think, you know, when you're a vegetarian in the 1980s, mm-hmm. you, you get a, you get a, like very quickly, you realize you got to learn something about nutrition because mm-hmm. you're going to be asked a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And and you, it's not like your parent. Do you have brothers and sisters? Or I do. You do. I have two sisters. Um, I think we, t- three of us, um, my mom and my youngest sister and I, sort of all made this leap around the same time. So oh, I had a lot of support. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. In support of you, or it was like a collective decision. It was a house. collective sort of, seren- you know, just we all kind of, I, m- I may have been the first one, but it, they followed pretty quickly after right. and, and not necessarily in support of me, but where, just. Where did you grow up? Baltimore. In Baltimore. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Interesting. So, all right. So you had some support in the house, but maybe not, you know, in the, in the hallways at, in high school. Not a lot of support in the hallways of high school, but not, not like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I had, I was excessively ridiculed or, you know, it was just kind of like, I think for people, it was just kind of a, a an anomaly that was curious, but not, mm-hmm. people kind of let me do my thing. Right. But it wasn't driven by health considerations no. at that time. It was just sort of a, an ethical glitch that you felt like needed to. Yeah. 
it was just, you know, it was just being, a, just living sort of, living in line with my values, I guess. Mm-hmm. And and so where does that, <clears throat> at what point does that, you know, lifestyle sort of intersect with, you know, your, your medical education? Where I am now? Yeah. Um, it, so it, it did not intersect for a very long time. And actually I was, you know, continued being a vegetarian and um, went through college and all this stuff in between before med school and med school and then um, residency training and all this time didn't really change my eating pattern, didn't really um, use, use what I knew about sort of the growing understanding of health benefits around being vegetarian to translate that to my patients. It was just kind of like, this is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of keep it to myself and just, you know, like keep working. And Right. But along the way, you're educa- you had mentioned like early on, you started to, you, you took it upon yourself to kind of educate yourself about how to do it in a healthy way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you had to, I mean, you really, I think at that point you really had to, I mean, I definitely had my like, you know, naders where I would be eating like white rice and cheese at, you know, mm-hmm. in the college dorm, but things weren't like they are today, but I definitely educated myself a lot. And what were the sources of education back then? Like what were the books that were available? (laughs) Yeah, uh, you're right. I mean, there wasn't, certainly wasn't the internet. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, there were, there were like a couple of guides out, but you You were kind of, kind of, kind of winging it. But then as I got to med school and residency, there was more stuff out there. But again, it really wasn't, um, it really wasn't a huge priority in the sense of something that I took upon myself to learn a great deal and then translate to my patients. I think, I think, you know, at the same time, I was starting to realize, you know, how little I knew about nutrition in general and how little doctors are trained because, A, we didn't have any nutrition classes Mm -hmm. in med school. And then in residency, I remember, um, you know, for example, having, you know, seeing a patient that had a new diagnosis of diabetes and then going back to present the case to my supervisor back then and saying, you know, this is the situation. And they would say, okay, well, why don't you just talk to them about like what to eat and so that they don't have to go on pills. And I would go back to the room and like knock on the door and go in and say hi um, and not have any idea what to tell them. Like I have (laughs) no idea. And, And that struck me as being really bad. Right. So let's park it here for a minute because, you know, it brings up so much about the, you know, our system of medical education and how we train doctors. And, you know, it's something that I've talked about quite a bit on the podcast, which is this, you know, kind of appalling, you know, scenario in which we're not training doctors on nutrition, like irrespective of whatever your dietary proclivity is. um, The simple fact that there is no formal education in nutrition whatsoever for aspiring doctors is just such a gaping hole. Like it's so crazy. It really is. You know, I think so zero, there was, there there was some, did you have electives? Like I've talked to other doctors like, oh, maybe a couple hours or I had to take this one thing, but it was really nothing. Unless I'm, unless I'm completely like just repressing it or not remembering Uh it, I don't think we had any. And I think that, I think, I think the figure is something like 25% of med schools or one in every four med school does not meet the recommended number of hours of nutrition. And the recommended number of hours is something like 25 Mm. for your whole four years. Yeah. But that recommendation isn't like set in, it's not like a a prerequisite, right? It's just recommended. Right. So the medical schools don't have, they can choose to follow that or not. Is that how it works? I believe so. I believe so. I think that's starting to change, but um, I think, I think the other issue is that what is taught in those nutrition classes or those hours of nutrition teaching, um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I know that, you know, a lot of med schools teach people and even residency programs teach people about like, you know, vitamin deficiencies Mm -hmm. and stuff that you're probably never going to see unless you practice somewhere outside the United States. Right. That's what Garth Davis was telling me. Like, oh, you, you know, for s- scenarios that arise, like if someone has gout or like just rare, condi- more super rare yeah. conditions where they have like an extreme deficiency. Yeah. I mean, I'm not like, I haven't seen scurvy in my whole career. Right. Like, you know, I mean, I, I, or maybe I have, and I just didn't recognize it, but I, I think that, I, I think, I think the most, v- I mean, what my mission is and what I think people, what doctors need to learn is just nutrition to prevent and 
treat the chronic diseases that we're taking care of all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to understand that like a typical day for me is diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, gout, Mm -hmm. kidney stones, heart disease, Alzheimer's, you know, everything is related to diet. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we, just to echo what you're saying, I mean, the fact that we don't, we're not given the training to use what is almost universally acknowledged as probably the most powerful tool is, is crazy. That is crazy. That is crazy. But you are doing something interesting to change that. Yeah. So you have this, uh, this grant, right, to teach or to do a study and then teach medical profession, professionals about nutrition. Is that accurate? Yeah, or, yeah that's so, accurate. So, so let's talk about that. Yeah. So if I could back up, I'll tell you sort of what got me to that point, mm-hmm. which is... Um, yeah, we're all over the place in the time, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I'm sure everyone's keeping <laughs> yeah. up. <laughs> Just press rewind. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that you know, it wasn't, my practice was still, even though I value this stuff so much, my practice was still very like pill-based and very treating symptoms based Mm -hmm. until a couple of years ago. And I have to talk about this because it was such a breakthrough moment for me. I went to, um, I don't know, I had some conference money and I just was like, what's a great conference, medical conference I can go to? And I Googled um, lifestyle change Mm -hmm. on a whim. And the first hit was uh, American College of Lifestyle Medicine was having their annual meeting. And as I, I I signed up for it, I went to the conference and it was a huge turning point in my career because it was a group of, I don't know, 400 or 500 other health professionals, mostly doctors that are interested in using lifestyle to prevent and treat disease. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the speakers at the conference were so inspiring. You know, I heard Dean Ornish, Mm -hmm. Neil Barnard, Michael Greger, who's Mm -hmm. hilarious and so smart and just captivating. And, um, you know, a number of other great speakers. And and I remember the first day of the conference being just feeling like I was zinging. Like I went back to my hotel room after the conference and just uh, like was reading articles and emailing stuff and felt like a manic episode was coming on. Wow. I mean, it just, it was like I finally had found, it, it took me realizing there's a whole community of people interested in the same thing and seeing these inspiring speakers. And um I think the second day I sat down for lunch, like the conference lunch, and I sat down and looked across the table and it was Caldwell Esselstyn Mm -hmm. was sitting there and like T. Colin Campbell's son who Mm co-wrote the China study. So it was just one inspiration after another. How many years had you been a doctor at that point? Um, I want to say eight. Wow. So Well, eight after... Yeah, eight after my training, after so right, a lot right, of years, right. many, yeah. many, many years, yeah. and you're, on, you know, in some respect, you're already living this lifestyle. You're interested in these right. things, and yet completely unaware that this world with all of these, you know, incredible people exists out there who are, you know, trying to change the system right. in a certain regard. And that was news to you, right? And I, that's amazing. Well, and I was also running. I mean, I've been, I still do run an obesity clinic. I run a weight management clinic, and I run it on lifestyle change. Um, but I think that the You know, when I'd gone to national, like, obesity conferences, there's not, there was, I remember one that I went to, there was not a single mention of food. Mm -hmm. Not a single mention. Mm. And... How is that even possible? I know, right? (laughs) Well, I mean, to be fair, I I think it was a bariatric, you know, Uh a a weight loss surgery based conference, but still, you still have to eat and it still matters. Right. I mean, Garth always talks about all those, because he goes to all those those conferences on bariatric surgery and obesity. And I guess, you know, what he says is that they're they're really pushing kind of the the high protein, you know, high fat, low carb diet. But then he always takes pictures of the breakfast you know, yeah. at the conference and it's just, you know, massive amounts oh, of bacon and eggs it's crazy. and like, you know, all kinds yeah. of crazy, you know, high saturated fat foods and yeah. all this sort of stuff. And he's like, this is what they're serving at the conference yeah. on obesity right. and bariatric surgery. Why are people why are people unpacking weight loss from chronic disease. Like, I don't understand it. Why are you using, you know, foods that promote chronic disease just because in the short term they might help with weight loss? And mm-hmm. and, not, and they don't even necessarily always do that either. Right. Um, but, yeah, I think there's confusion about the difference between weight loss and health. Yeah. You think? or I Well, I think that um, certainly, you know, t- certainly there's an argument to be made that 
for, if you are obese and probably if you're overweight, you, you know, losing weight is beneficial. Mm-hmm. But I, I think, you know, A, it's about, we'll probably get into this, but A, it's about sustainability, right? And B, it's about what are, you know, what you're doing to lose weight. All those approaches are not equal in terms of chronic disease prevention. Mm-hmm. So for some people, I mean, there's such a desperation around weight loss, which is completely understandable that I do think people separate that out. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess if you're, you know, if you're in a in a critical situation, that weight loss takes priority over everything else, right? Like, you, like critical, meaning like you have a, well, a you, wedding coming up. Or no, something. no. I mean, if you weigh <laughs> 400 pounds and you're looking at, you know, yeah. blood markers that are really bad, it's like you got to get the weight off, right? So, you know, listen, you know, Atkins or those kind of protocols are very effective at doing that, but but that's not necessarily the healthiest way or the most sustainable way to do it, but you'll lose the weight, right? Well, but unless you switch your lifestyle to something that you can sustain, you're going to gain it back. Right. And I've seen that, met, you know, many, like literally hundreds of times. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I went to this, you know, I went to this conference. I was completely energized. I remember coming back that Monday morning after the conference, like my first, my nine o'clock patient was this patient with uncontrolled diabetes and her sugars were, you know, in the 200s all the time, um, which is very high. And she was already maxed out on all her pills. And Mm -hmm. I think like, you know, literally four days before I probably would have said, okay, you got to go on insulin. And, but that morning, I just remember feeling so empowered to say to her, like, let's sit down and talk about what you're eating Mm -hmm. and go through it. And it sounds so obvious, right? But, but it, the paradigm that we that most doctors practice in is is it doesn't a it doesn't support that and we're not we're just not trained to think about it that way. Mm-hmm. So um, so as I, I started incorporating this stuff more and more into my practice with great success and and you know started thinking like this is not you know this is, I'm just one person and. I'm doing this with my patients, but I have obviously a fraction of the patients that are being cared for at this hospital. I have a you know an uh, we have to spread this, like other people have to find out about this. And I'm in a great position to teach people because I'm teaching people 50% of the week. Mm-hmm. So that's why I decided to apply for that grant. And um, the grant is, it's a very small grant and it's its a colleague and I who's also interested in this stuff. Um, it's the, the idea is to study, like take the first year of the grant to just study all the evidence mm-hmm. behind different nutritional approaches. And then in the second year to translate that out to people in a way that's really practical that, mm-hmm. and usable. And mm-hmm. we're going to offer it to our faculty colleagues and to uh, the resident doctors as well. Right. So the idea is to actually teach medical professionals, not, not average people, right? It is. Our primary goal is that. But I think that what I hope is that in, in their learning about it, then they'll teach it back to their patients. Right, That's right, right. obviously the ultimate right, goal. Right, right. But it's the, the idea is to like create a different kind of culture right. around diet and food and lifestyle within the profession. Exactly. Right. And so how do you approach the, you know, daunting prospect of studying different nutritional protocols and their impact on health? Because certainly there's no shortage of these kinds of studies out there. Yeah. And we could go down the rabbit hole on, you know, that whole world. Right. But, you know, how are you kind of approaching that? Yeah, I mean, I it's um, it really is a rabbit hole, and um, I feel overwhelmed a lot of the time. And and I think if I feel that way, it's understandable that other people feel that way. And I think for me, the you know what I'm trying to um, what what really anchors me is the concept that there really is there really is broad consensus. I think around the healthiest ways of eating. Mm-hmm. And so I want to understand where that consensus came from. And I want to look to the literature and see, you know, why do people say, for example, that, you know, whole grains are so important? Why does everyone agree that vegetables and fruits are so important? I mean, it sounds, we, you know, people who are kind of in the know take that for granted. But mm-hmm. I think when you're sitting down and talking to a bunch of medical professionals, they're going to want to know some of the evidence, not. And I, well, and I also think like, I would say that there is a consumer notion out there right now that is gaining popularity that would contravene that and say, you shouldn't eat grains and, you know, fruit is just as bad as candy and you shouldn't eat that too. I mean, there's so many 
crazy ideas out there. Right. So it, it becomes difficult to even begin to approach, you know, any of it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, you know the the media and popular culture sort of hang on to the tensions, right, and the differences. Um, but if if you really start looking at most of the literature, it really it it, it really does. There is broad consensus mm-hmm. around what we should be eating, and there is a lot of overlap between paleo and vegan or plant based. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can get into why you know reasons why I think plant based is is gonna, is my approach, but um, and I think is a better approach. But but there is consensus, and I think that's the main message. You know, that is one message I want to impart to my colleagues and the trainees. And I think just the power that this has to affect change is the other message. Okay, so if someone's listening, you know, the question that's coming into their head right now is like, all right, well, what is the consensus? Like, if you could tell me, you know, let's cut through all the, you know, crazy ideas on both sides of the equation and all the warring and infighting and all of that. Like, what are the, you know, I don't know, five or six things that, you know, basically the studies that you've looked at all kind of agree on. Okay. Number one, eliminating processed foods. Mm -hmm. So by processed, um, because this question comes up a lot, you know, when I talk to patients, what is, what is a processed food? So um, what I tell my patients is just eat as close to its natural form, eat food as close to its natural form as you can. So I tell them, you know, if you're, if you're, if it's a, if it's a piece of bread, did it, you know, think about the food in front of you. Did it grow in a tree or from the earth, mm-hmm. you know, in that format? And just keep reminding yourself of eating in the format that's most, that's closest to the earth. So processed foods, there's a, a tremendous amount of evidence around eliminating those because what we're saying when we're saying processed foods are refined carbohydrates and processed meat. Mm-hmm. And those are, and I mean, processed meat probably trumps everything. Like if you had to tell somebody to just eliminate one thing, it would be processed meat. And again, there's broad consensus on that. Right. So that's hot dogs, cold cuts. What are the other things? Yeah, I'm glad you said cold cuts because a lot of people don't even realize that. Mm -hmm. Like you get a, like a deli, like deli turkey slices on like whole grain and they, you know, people are, that, that is a processed meat. Um, so bacon, salami, sausage, mm-hmm. hot dogs, right. like you said. Um, so these are very, there's, there's nearly unequivocal data that these are increased the risk of cancer and heart disease and early death. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a slam dunk. Refined carbohydrates, probably as bad for you as saturated fat, right. you know, if you're going to look at the studies. And the, the the top of the list on that would be what, like crackers and, you know, kind of snack foods or, you know, what are the, what are the worst processed carbohydrate foods? I mean, Refi- like white bread, things like that. Yeah. I mean, pasta. a lot of the like, where does pasta fall on that? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the white, you know, sort of you take a whole grain, you remove the outer, layers that has fiber and B vitamins and phytonutrients, you're left with a product that's um, rapidly gets converted into sugar in your blood and um, causes insulin spikes. And that's the idea. So examples are, you know, a lot of like breakfast cereals, Mm -hmm. anything where the first ingredient is flour or milled rice or, um, you know, the white bread, all the pastries, the white rolls. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, like, you know, soda is the ultimate example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. Beverage, like, you know, all the bottled beverages that people drink and ice, sweetened iced teas and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so processed meats, processed carbs. Yeah. Um, Then there's broad consensus that we should be eating more fiber. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I think, like, you talk about all the, you know, things that we're really, the, the deficiency that Americans have that we should be learning about. It's not, you know, it's not the vitamin deficiencies you may learn about in med school if you're lucky. It's fiber, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the average American, I think it's like 15 grams of fiber a day. And um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty pathetic amount. Yeah, there's some crazy stat out there that, like, I don't know what it is, you know, 80 
plus percent of people are fiber deficient. Right. I think but, it's even higher. Yeah, yeah. But we're all worried about protein. Right. But like nobody's it's, protein deficient. Right, right, <laughs> right. I, uh, you know, you're protein deficient if you're like not eating enough calories. Right. You're, if you're starving, it's right. a starvation thing. That's right. right. That's absolutely right. But the protein thing is really the big barrier, I think, you know, mentally for people to kind of, you know, grapple with the idea of going plant-based. I mean, they get a lot of messages to to make them concerned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everywhere you turn. Right. And I think people have this magical idea that you, you know, the more protein you eat, the more like basically more muscles you're going to have and more mm -hmm. built. And, you know, I, t I see patients all the time who are drinking protein shakes and they're sort of adding that on to their normal diet and gaining tons of weight and it's not muscle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to turn to fat. Right. So let's talk about that. Like, yeah. like what, is the, what, is, what is the implication of, you know, exceeding your recommended? Well, first of all, what is the recommended daily allowance of protein and, and what is the impact of exceeding that in, in the health context? Yeah. So, the, you know, I think when, they, when you look at when, when the Institute of Medicine came up with recommendations on how much protein we need, it was based on nitrogen balance studies where you kind of feed people protein and you see how much nitrogen comes out in the urine and you try to find a place where you're you're neither in negative balance or positive balance. So you're you're getting the protein that you need for your normal cellular activities in your in your day. Um, so the number that they came up with for most people was about 0.6 grams for every kilogram of body weight for the average person. Mm -hmm. And then they decided, you know, let's let's round this up just to make sure we cover everybody. It's a bell curve. You know, there's going to be people at either end. So let's make it 0.8. And so I think people People who look at that number, if you even look at that number, think that that's the minimum amount, but really it's actually the amount where everyone will be getting, you know, the 90, I think it's like 95% of people will be getting the amount of protein that they need. So mm -hmm. it's more of an, it's, you should think of it more as an optimal amount. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are special situations, you know, in athletes and bodybuilders and so forth, where you may need a little bit more. But I think that what the overestimation that people do is so great and, mm -hmm. and they're already eating more protein than they need to begin with. Um, so I think it really, for most people, it's a mood point and the average, the average person that I take care of and the average person I think in this country is, I think the statistics are that they're getting, you know, 70% more protein than they need. Mm -hmm. And so what happens when you're exceeding that, you know, limit? So, um, you know, for the, the average person, I'm yeah. not talking about a bodybuilder or an endurance. Sure, sure. Like so for the average person, I mean, the extra protein is extra calories. And if you don't need them, they will be, they'll turn to fat or you will either metabolize them by your kidney or your liver and get rid of them. Some combination of that. Mm -hmm. And there are, there is such a wealth of data around what happens when you eat an excess of protein and particularly animal protein. Um, this has not been shown for plant protein specifically. Um, and the, the things that the totality of the data show are that your, your risk of diabetes goes way up. Mm. And I mean, and the, this is data from studies of hundreds of thousands of people over years. It's not like one, you know, small study. It's, and it's been replicated in numerous studies. So that's a big one. Um, Almost all studies show that your risk of heart disease goes up with higher doses of animal protein. Mm -hmm. um, there are studies showing that mortality goes up. There's a pretty concerning link with cancer. And, you know, the thinking behind that, um, there's this molecule called IGF-1. I don't know if, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. insulin-like growth factor one and protein, animal protein very clearly increases this growth factor. And you do need some of this growth factor, um, but you'll make it if you eat a, you know, in a, in a recommended way. And so if you make extra of it, it's very closely linked with cancer. So I think that, um, and then of course, obesity, which I alluded to before, if you had to select out, you know, the studies show that if you have to select out one type of food that is most associated with weight gain, both cross-sectionally, so like at one point in time, and over the course of, you know, prospectively over the course of a number of years, mm -hmm. it's meat. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because right now everybody thinks that it's sugar. It's all about sugar right now in our kind of reductionist culture of trying to pinpoint one thing. Um, I would say that's, you know, enemy number one right now. So when somebody comes in to your office uh, 
and and that's their notion. I mean, I'm not defending sugar. I mean, sugar is a huge problem. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you usually kind of you know discuss that? Yeah, I'm not a fan of sugar either. Um, I think that I try to put it in perspective for people. So a typical scenario might be, you know, a person comes to me and they're concerned, you know, they're concerned about, you know, preventing diabetes and because they have a family history or whatever. And so the first thing they'll ask me is, you know, I'm, can I, should I use Splenda instead of like a teaspoon of sugar in my morning coffee? And if that's all the sugar they're having in their whole day, I'm not that worried about it. That's a very small amount of sugar. And I think there's a miss, a com- people completely miss the boat because the message just isn't out there that it's other things that they're doing, like the animal proteins or refined carbohydrates that are driving that disease risk. Mm-hmm. So um, that said, I also have plenty of patients that are, you know, guzzling soda. And that's a pretty, you know, I would say in terms of, lifestyle changes to target, it's actually a pretty easy one to help people change. So it is kind of the low hanging fruit of the nutrition counseling world. Just saying, you know, stop drinking soda. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. a very specific thing that everyone can kind of understand. Yeah. And people don't realize, I mean, people are starting to realize about soda, but then I think, you know, people don't realize about all the other sugary drinks that are out there that are just tantalizing you all the time, like everywhere, the delis and the, you know, the grocery stores and they taste good and people mm-hmm. like them and they don't realize that how many calories they're getting and what they're doing to their um, metabolism with mm-hmm. those. So those, that's kind of the low hanging fruit. And I always target that. Right. All right. Well, back to the protein thing. Um, you're sort of, we're talking about the difference between animal protein and, and plant protein. I mean, what about this idea that plant protein is inferior to animal protein that, you know, especially for, you know, listen, if you're, if you're uh, athletic or you want to be fit or you want to perform at your peak, there's this idea that if you're only eating plant proteins, that you're, you're really not getting what you need in order to, you know, build, build muscle, you know, recover quickly, all these sorts of things. I mean, you're, you know, people like you are, it's awesome that you guys have, are spreading that message and really showing people that that's not true. Biochemically, that's not true. Um, Is there any difference other than the fact that animal protein comes with all sorts of other things, right. like you know, saturated fat, et right. cetera, and depending upon where you get the meat. Uh, but with respect to just the protein aspect of it, uh, are there differences in bioavailability? I mean, there's going to be differences in the percentage of, you know, you know, essential amino acids and all of that. Like, I understand that. But like, what are these differences? And should we care? Uh, no, I mean, we, sh- we, sh- we should, well, we should care to the extent that when you, again, when you look at studies, the the evidence just trumps the fact that we have to, like animal protein is not conducive to long-term health. And the, you know, if you're going to look at the biochemical level and absorption and synthesis and cellular function, you know, you do need to get all your essential amino acids, but on a plant-based diet, you get them. And it's not, you know, I think there's this tendency to think that we need to make it as easy as possible for our bodies to get the food. But you know what? Sometimes it's not good to make it as easy as possible. So if you take if you eat a steak, yeah, you know, you're getting what we call a complete protein. It has all the essential amino acids um, because it's muscle, mm-hmm. right? It's it's an animal's flesh. And so you you are necessarily getting all the, the, the essential amino acids, but we are able to group them together. And if we get, you know, some of them, if we have a bowl of you know, beans, and then later on we have a whole grain, you can, your body has the ability to pool it all together. And in a way that long-term studies show actually promotes health rather than, mm-hmm. so well, I, now you're just crazy talking. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Um, so, all right. So, I mean, basically what you're saying is this is a non-issue. It's is a non-issue. Like, I don't want to mischaracterize your your words, but no, that was a fair yeah. characterization. It's a hundred percent a non-issue. I think you know if you're if you're trying to build a lot of muscle and you're really you know you're you're training and you're a bodybuilder and you know we all you featured on your podcast and we all know about you know the huge movement around vegan bodybuilding and um, NFL stars and and so forth. I mean, yes, you you do need more protein, but there's no evidence to say that it's 
to my knowledge, that it's better to, in the short term even to have animal protein. And certainly in the long term, it's not better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, all I have to go on is my experience and then the testimony of the people that I've spoken to or I've had on the podcast. And, you know, when I talk to all these plant-based athletes, I mean, they're basically echoing what, you, what you're saying. And my experience is that it just, it doesn't really seem to, it, it, I don't feel like it's impeded me. You know, I feel like eating plant-based has allowed my body to recover more quickly. I feel I mean, like I repair myself more quickly in between workouts. Right. And and if it's impeded you, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to know what else you could possibly do other than what you've already done. You know, I, I, I think that um, you bring up a great point, which is it's not, you know, people tend to reduce it all to, to protein. But what about um, other things that are essential to recovery and to performance um, that you'd find in other plant foods? How do you feel about um, this idea of, you know, alkaline forming foods versus acid forming foods and the impact on metabolism? Um, To be honest, I've never like I've never been in that. I've never gotten swayed by that whole acid versus alkaline um, argument. But Mm -hmm. to me, it's just, again, another marker for the benefits of eating plant-based because plant foods tend to be alkaline. Mm -hmm. And again, looking at the evidence, we know that the foods that tend to be acidic, which are animal proteins, tend to cause cause harm. So if if that helps you, if that's a framework that helps people understand, you know, a healthy way to eat, then great. They can use that, you know, that framework, but I, to me, it's just a marker for the same concept. Right. I mean, the idea is that by eating alkaline forming foods, it's very, um, it's very anti-inflammatory, right? As opposed to eating acid forming foods, which provoke inflammation. And then there's this nexus between chronic inflammation and all the lifestyle disease that you alluded to before. Right. And when you're kind of right. reducing that inflammation in an athletic context, uh, it expedites your body's ability to kind of bounce back and heal itself. There's a definitely a connection between chronic inflammation and illness, and um, and probably lack of performance in in athletic endeavors. But um, I think that there's more than just the acid base status of the food that drives inflammation. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot we don't understand, but we know that you know even oil, for example, you know you they've shown that after a very high fat meal, that's mostly animal fats, um, but even also with vegetable oils, that your blood vessels ability to um, to dilate or, or, or to open up is impaired for about six hours. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways that food can cause inflammation. And I think, you know, the acid base theory or argument is just one of them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, I want to segue a little bit into kind of... Um, diet philosophies in, in a more macro sense. And, and, you know, you said earlier that, you know, there's a lot of similarities between eating plant-based and, and eating paleo. And there's a lot of paleo people that listen to this podcast. And so let's talk about what those similarities are and, and what that common ground is. Yeah. I mean, I think the common ground is a uh, lack of processing of food. So, you know, eating foods as close to their origin as possible um, and focusing on vegetables and hopefully fruits, um, you know, and eliminating dairy. Obviously, that's a common um, thread there. You know, the whole the whole grain argument is one that I don't really buy into because I think the evidence is so strong that eating what we call cereal fiber, um, which doesn't it's not like special K. You know, mm-hmm. it's 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 fiber that comes from grains. Um, that's the, when people do big studies, that's what they're referring to when they say cereal fiber. The evidence is so potent um, for these, for this in preventing disease. For example, you know, when you look at what, what is the number one, you know, the foods, the food category that's best at preventing diabetes, it's actually whole grains. Mm. And so it kind of turns our conventional understanding of you know, what a diabetic should avoid or what someone should avoid on its head, right? I mean, because everybody always thinks right away, right away carbs, but really those are some of the most protective foods. So to me, eliminating that whole category is a problem. Well, it seems like there's a lot of 
when you say grains, I mean, that's sort of an umbrella term for many, many things. I mean, that could mean, you know, Wonder Bread or it could mean, you know, some kind of heirloom millet. (laughs) You know, so, (laughs) so, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole panoply of, of, you know, subcategories within that. And I think, you know, I think it is, you know, okay to say, or, you know, fair to say that today's wheat is, you know, not our grandmother's wheat, that it's highly hybridized. And, you know, in, in certain respects, it's been stripped of much of its nutritional value and it's growing in soil that is not as nutritionally dense as it once was. And it's higher in gluten and all these other things. So it's, it's different, you know, it's different than it once was. So what grain are we talking about? Where did it grow? Is it sprouted? Is it whole? Or is it, you know, stripped and refined? Um, I, you know, your point is well taken, but I think, I think we need to remember that really very little that we eat now is what it used to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, right? I mean, yeah, everything, yeah, yeah, that's true. everything is hybridized. Meat's not the same. Yeah. Certainly, we're, we're, breeding, we're breeding animals to be the way that they're most profitable and have the highest fat, you know, now they have very high fat contents, they grow quickly and so forth. So the meat that we eat is not the same. Um, Even, and even, you know, we can get into the whole like grass fed movement. Um, But even then it's still not the same as, you know, what people argue we used to eat. Um, And so nothing's the same. So, you know, again, I just have to keep coming back to what the evidence shows and, there are a lot of different kinds of grains, but no one, like, at the end of the day, we're talking about grains in their most intact form. It, I think it would be optimal to eat food that's, you know, as close to nature as possible. Um, you know, the whole GMO overlay is another thing. Um, but when you just strictly look at the evidence, I think there's a lot of evidence for just eating whole grains. And mm-hmm. And I think we also have to remember, and I, you know, I, because I'm such a nutrition nerd and I'm reading stuff online all the time, I, like, it is very anchoring for me to go back to my practice on, you know, a Monday morning at nine o'clock after reading nutrition stuff all the time, all weekend. And then, I mean, I do other things That's too. What I was going to say, is this your Saturday <laughs> I night? I do other things What'd too. What did you do last night? It's um, Sunday morning here, so <laughs> what, how, you know, <laughs> how did you spend um, last night? No, no, that's funny. So, uh. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I think it's very anchoring to walk into, to talk to real people that are living their lives and have stressful lives and go to work and, you know, and don't don't necessarily think about all this stuff that we're talking about at a really high level. And they're just trying to make like affordable, healthy choices for themselves. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to, you know, it would be great if everyone could have like some you know, artisanal millet. But I think mm-hmm. that at the end of the day, like they have to, they're going to go to the grocery store in their neighborhood, who, you know, and there's a lot of issues with food access there too. Mm-hmm. And they're going to have to make choices and they're going to have to be taught what are the healthiest choices there. Mm-hmm. So I keep it pretty simple. And I think I try to stay out of the, you know, I try to keep pulling myself back to reality. Right, right. Okay, so back to the original question, which is like <laughs> finding similarities between yeah. paleo and vegan, but actually grains is a difference, right? Right. Like paleo is no grains. Right. Um, so so you're saying grain. So we talked about grains. So in terms of other similarities, I mean, no processed food, uh, no dairy, you know, whole foods, lots of vegetables. Um, I don't know if it's, we agree on the fruit thing. right. Right. I, that's a good question. I guess it depends on what subset of paleo right. you're ascribing to. But, right. but I think overall, yeah, I mean, it's basically whole foods close to their natural state, you know, and, right. and then you can get granular from that. Um, but, but then kind of, you know, sort of sidestepping away from that, um, you know, I thought it would be informative to kind of look at some of the, the nutritional trends that are seemingly getting a lot of traction mm-hmm. in public awareness right now. And, you know, the number one thing that always comes to my mind is like the Time Magazine cover of, you know, Butter is Back. And, and <clears throat> you know, within that, um, within that kind of uh, framework is this idea that, you know, everything you heard about saturated fat is incorrect. Um, you know, saturated fat is your new best friend. Uh, it's really all about sugar being evil and, um, you know, eating a high fat, low carb diet is really the way to go. I mean, there's a lot of, that's kind of what's in the zeitgeist at the moment. So, and I'm sure that you have patients coming to you who, you know, perhaps are, are you know, ascribing to this because this is what they're seeing and hearing. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, as I was saying earlier, I think that, you know, it's very um, titillating for the media to take a headline like that, right? And people, I, I think a lot of people would love to hear that butter is back. And so it it makes headlines. People, you know, want to hear that. Um, I think that, you know, specifically to address the saturated fat issue, and I, and I know um, Garth Davis talked about this a lot too, mm -hmm. but the the two studies that sort of drove those headlines, um, there's been a tremendous amount of controversy in, at the level of nutrition research and the medical community about those studies and how they were designed, um, some sort of gross errors in data abstraction. Um, there were a lot of concerns raised about industry ties and um, particularly with the dairy um, industry. And there were concerns that key studies were left out of because they were meta-analyses. You know, they were, they were sort of grouping together the results of, mm -hmm. of previously published studies. Mm -hmm. So they had left out key studies. So, and I think it, I think Garth also said that uh, even under, you know, the, the most, you know, sort of positive reading of it, it never said that saturated fat is good. Correct. Right? It wasn't, correct. It wasn't drawing that conclusion. That's right. That's right. Even if you found no problems with the methodology and you took those studies results at face value, you would not be able to conclude that saturated fat is actually good for you. That is, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. And it was he's more, right. It was more a, a, a factor of how harm, or not being as harmful as we once thought or right. something like that. Right. And it's always relative. So whatever, it depends, you know, if you're eliminating saturated fat from your diet, and first of all, nobody has like bowls of like protein, saturated fat, or whatever, like they yeah. eat food, right? So if you're eliminating stuff that has saturated fat, what are you replacing it with? And that's the key question. So if you take a study like that low carb, um, there was a low carb, low fat versus low fat study published last year, about 150 people, and they randomized them to either eat a low carb diet or a low fat diet. Um, the people in the low the low fat arm were replacing the fat with refined carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So sure, that's not going to, they're never going to win out. Mm -hmm. So it's always a question of that. And it's always a question of how much people adhere to the actual diet. Like the low fat arm didn't, they didn't even really reduce their fat right, that much. Right, it wasn't that low fat, right? Exactly. So um, that's the whole thing too, just to, you know, sorry for interrupting, but there, there's this idea that, you know, oh, for the last 30, however many years, it was all about low fat. Well, that didn't work. So, but it's like, no, it's just that no one did it. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? like, right, right, yeah. right. People are always really surprised to learn that. Um, you know, we, I think that if I'm understanding the numbers correctly, as a percentage of total calories, we've decreased fat over the, in like 1% or some very small number, but we're just eating more calories. So in terms of grams of fat, we're not, we haven't cut back at all. Mm -hmm. So um, the other big issue with those saturated fat studies was, um, and I think um, Garth mentioned this, was that in one of them, you know, about half the studies controlled for people's cholesterol levels. So if you take out the major you know, the major um, way in which saturated fat creates heart disease and, and disease in general, if you control for that, then of course you're not going to find a difference. Wait, so let me understand that. So when you say control for cholesterol, that means that uh, they, they selected for people that were with, already within a certain cholesterol range, or I'm, I'm not sure I so, understand. So, so um, Basically, because we know that our blood levels of cholesterol are highly correlated with how much saturated fat we eat, um, in these, in in about half, or I think maybe like forty percent of the studies that were included in the big meta analysis, they had actually statistically adjusted for people's cholesterol levels. So, for example, if my total cholesterol was two hundred and fifty, mm -hmm. and somebody else's was one hundred and twenty, they statistically have a way of eliminating that as a variable. I see. So therefore, if mine is 250 and yours is 120, and I'm eating a lot of saturated fat and you're not, but we control for the intermediate risk factor, which is cholesterol levels in the blood, then it's going to, you know, you're not going to see, you're not going to necessarily a big, see a big difference between the two groups. I see. Interesting. Um, well, one thing you said right there is is being kind of contested by certain people out there, which is, the relationship between saturated fat
fat intake and serum cholesterol, right? So, so in other words, uh, dietary cholesterol is not as related to serum cholesterol as we once thought. This is this idea out there, right? So that eating saturated fat doesn't necessarily impact your cholesterol levels. So, so the, so, so separating out, um, dietary saturated fat and dietary cholesterol. Um, that is an important distinction to make because dietary cholesterol does not have such a predictable effect on our blood levels of cholesterol mm -hmm. as saturated fat does. I don't know that there's too much evidence to support saturated fat not driving up cholesterol levels. That's pretty much universally acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So both in terms of like laboratory, like controlled laboratory experiments where they infuse, you know, where they have people eat a lot of saturated fat and they measure their blood levels of cholesterol, you can see it like in a linear fashion increasing. So I, I don't think that there's, there's that much contest around that. But yes, the people's response to dietary cholesterol is more variable. Mm -hmm. And the problem is those things go together in food. Right. So I'm so how do you eat dietary cholesterol and not eat saturated fat. You are those That's that, my homework. Is that even that's my homework. I'll try to yeah, figure like, it out. I, don't know. I I you can't. Exactly. So and again like people don't at the end of the day people are not choosing foods based on like calories from you know saturated fat. They're just choosing food. Mm -hmm. And you know most people and I don't think it's a useful construct to talk to people about please get, you know, this percentage of calories from this nutrient and avoid, you know, I think we have to talk to people about foods that promote health and foods that don't and take it back to like the, the bird's eye understanding. Mm -hmm. um, well, that kind of brings up this issue of ketosis and sort of setting aside the fact that like eating this way probably is um, probably not getting a lot of fiber. Well, I guess if you ate a lot of vegetables, perhaps you could, but, but um you know, I got beat up a little bit on the internet because I was on a podcast and I, and I happened to say uh, that I wasn't so sure that, uh, you know, ketosis was a lifestyle that, that I really aspired to and that, that, you know, it seemed to me to be, you know, and not being a scientist or a doctor or any, someone with any kind of medical or, or, or formal nutrition education, um, that my understanding was that ketosis was kind of uh, an emergency state of the body. Um, where your body has to kind of, you know, scramble and shift the way that it metabolizes nutrients for energy to, you know, sort of accommodate the fact that you're glycogen deprived and that, you know, the brain runs on glycogen and that, you know, I just didn't think that this seemed to be something that, you know, you shouldn't, like natural man's not going around measuring their ketones all the time. Like I, it just doesn't seem to me to be kind of a healthy way of living. And, you know, I got blasted by a bunch of, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, you what don't understand. The, what, was the, <clears throat> what, what was the criticism specifically? The, criti the criticism was that I didn't know the first thing about ketosis. I mean, it, what you've just described is my medical understanding. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. So, <laughs> so you did pretty well without any yeah, formal. All right. Uh, <laughs> well, so so because listen, there's a you know there's a subset of you know maybe it's not paleo. It gets all confusing, yeah. but of the kind of um, you know high fat, low carb diet protocol that a lot of athletes are kind of getting on board with. They're actually kind of really trying to get into that ketosis state and and testing how their body performs athletically. Um, and you know maybe they're you know, looking at performance goals and not necessarily at longevity goals or long-term health goals. But, um, but, you know, let me explain to me what ketosis is and what the kind of health implications of kind of being in that metabolic state are. Yeah. I mean, it's an, it's an unnatural, it's an unnatural state in that it's not the state that our bodies were designed to live in. We're designed to closely regulate our body's pH um, for optimal cellular function. So if you're depriving yourself of nutrients that your body has to go into an emergency state to start using to create ketone bodies because you don't have, um, you know, you, you, you don't have the nutrients you need that feed your brain normally, that is not a good, that is not an optimal state. That is an emergency state. It's, it's, a, it's a, like a backup generator. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to live on like a backup generator. That's not an optimal state. Now, I can't tell you, I don't think I've looked at, 
I don't even know if there are studies, but I haven't looked at studies showing that in the very short term, how that affects athletic performance. I can't really speak to that, but. Yeah, I mean, the idea is that it helps with being fat adapted. You okay. know, so if you're an endurance athlete, it's all about efficiency. And the more that you can become uh, reliant upon your your fat stores for fuel as opposed to glycogen, then you you can go longer and et cetera. Right, I mean, I would question, you know, I, all I can tell you is that when you see human beings in ketosis and you take care of people in ketotic states, they don't feel well. They're very, very sick. And maybe this is just a milder form, but um, I can only really speak to like long-term optimal health. There is there is no way that that can be and can produce an optimal situation. Mm-hmm. So when you say like they're they're very sick, like what is that sickness? Yeah, I mean, they have... What are the symptoms? Yeah, I mean, they have mental fogginess. They feel nauseous. They're often dehydrated. Um, You know, they're just, uh, they're fatigued. So again, because of the type of practice that I have, I'm not necessarily talking about if you're doing it in a milder form for athletic performance, but I'm talking about more extreme cases. But Mm -hmm. I just can't imagine that that's a good long-term strategy. And again, just again, taking it back to the big picture, the foods that put you in that state, you know, or depriving yourself of the foods to get yourself in that state is not evidence-based at all. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, because there's, there's, uh, what are the names of, is it not David Perlmutter, but uh, Professor Tim Noakes, are you familiar with his work? Like no. He's one of the per- people out there that talks a lot about this. Um, all right. Anyway, so let's get back to like your practice. And um, we kind of diverted way off the timeline there. But, but uh, yeah. you know, we, we, where we left it off was, was that <laughs> you had gone to this conference and right. okay, uh, good. you were yeah. so inspired. And then you began yeah. to sort of incorporate some of these tools that you <clears> learned <throat> into helping your patients. But at this point, were you completely plant-based yourself or is that what pushed you into kind of, you know, adopting a lifestyle in your, your own personal life or? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I'm, I'm glad you came back to that. Um, so around 2007, I want to say, um, a, a shift, like a, like a switch went off for me around, um, awareness of the foods that I was eating and what, what happened, like what was going on for me to be able to eat like cheese and yogurt. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, I'd already had, I was already a vegetarian, but I think I've, I really internalized the information around, you know, what actually necessarily has to happen for, to animals for me to eat dairy and cheese. And, um, and I think that, and eggs, and I, and I think when you, for, I still believe that for a lot of people, if you actually internalize that information, if you actually like don't shut it out and you take it in and you you see it, it is very hard to eat those foods. Like mm-hmm. that's the bottom line. And I was I was like that. Right. Well, the system's set up to prevent you from understanding that. They work very hard to create that iron curtain. Very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I that mean, curtain's coming down. Slowly. Yeah, not in North well, Carolina. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, there's <laughs> for every, you know, for every new ag gag law, there's a new drone that's, you know, with a GoPro I, on it. Have <laughs> you watched that stuff? <laughs> yeah, yes. I, Will Potter is like uh-huh. a hero. And oh, he's amazing. Mark DeVries mm-hmm. and his films, um, his drone stuff is, is great. But so, yeah, a switch went off for me. I internalized the information and I just felt like, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I think Gene Bauer really says it best. And you know, I don't know if your listeners, I know you had him on the podcast, mm-hmm. but he's the um, founder, uh, one of the founders of Farm Sanctuary. I mean, he really says it best when you, you know, the point is living in alignment with your values, right? And I'm not, to me, the values are very simple and it's the same values I'm practicing when I'm a doctor. You know, I'm, I've, I value compassion and I value connection and I value not causing harm. And to me, it's like, why am I separating that out? I mean, we're all interconnected. I'm not, I don't want to cause harm to the planet. I don't want to cause harm to other living beings. So uh, to me, that was, that was a he- very sentinel moment. I made a, another, yet another dietary shift and went plant-based slash vegan. Um, but again, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't incorporate it into my practice until mm-hmm. after that, this conference that I've been talking about. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like for me now, <clears throat> I feel like for me now, since like going to that conference and realizing that, you know, I have this passion about 
this way of eating that is, you know, when you take like the the health aspect, the sustainability and the environment, and you take, you know, compassion and and concern for other living beings, and you mesh them all together, this is really the the only way of eating that brings that all together. So for me, like you talk about finding ultra, right? Mm -hmm. For me, this was finding ultra. Mm -hmm. This was my ultra. You found your ultra. I found my ultra. (laughs) Um, It was a long time coming, but I think it's- It was for me too. (laughs) (laughs) I think you actually got a couple of years on me. But but no, I mean, for me, it's like it's renewed my, my passion around around practicing medicine and and around life in general. I feel like I my purpose, I'm authentic, I'm living, like there's no dissonance between mm-hmm. how I, the choices I'm making and how what I'm putting out there in the world. Yeah, that's a really cool thing when you can kind of, like I feel that now too. And if you told me many years ago, like that that was even something that is important, like I would have been like, what are you talking about? But there really is something intangible, um, but very real about, <clears throat> aligning your values with your actions, you know? And when you don't have that dissonance or that like, you know, when you're not, when you're when you're saying one thing and doing another, and we all, to some extent, because we live in the modern world and we're, nobody's perfect, there's some level of that in all of us, right. you know? And it's like, look, right. you know, I fly in airplanes and I drive a car and I right. do all these kinds of things right. that harm the planet. You right. know, it's like, I'm not standing up on a pedestal <laughs> like I'm some, you know, s- you know, superior being, I'm very much not. But, but when, you, when I make that choice to say, well, this is important to me and I'm going to make sure that my actions line up with that, like there's a self-esteem that comes with that. And there's, you know, I don't know, there's something about that that really changes the quality of your life. It absolutely does. And I am far from perfect either. And I think that recognizing that is actually, um, is actually beneficial because, you know, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean do nothing. It just means get started. Mm-hmm. You know, just get started. Just just see like what are the changes that are possible for you to start with that are in alignment with your values. And you don't have to you can decide where you're gonna draw the line. Um for me, the line's at one place and um and I feel great about living within that line. Mm-hmm. And what I think is really cool about it is that it's not like making that choice has a negative impact on some other aspect of your life. Like you can be an athlete. Right. You can do what's right for the planet, and you can take out an insurance policy against disease. You can <laughs> right. even reverse diseases that right. you've had or things that have been, you know, bothersome for you your whole life, right. whether it's like skin problem, like all these sorts of things. So it's like, yeah, maybe you crave a certain food that you like to eat. Like that's basically the biggest negative aspect of the whole thing. But if you kind of can weather through that, yeah. you know, short-term discomfort and get to the other side of it, there's a certain freedom that comes with that that I think is a really beautiful thing. And it's and it's absolutely, and it's beyond, um, it's actually been pretty eye-opening in terms of like the, the just the diversity of foods that I eat now compared to before I went plant-based slash vegan. Um, People don't, they don't believe that. Though. I know, I don't they know don't why buy, they don't. They, they don't buy it. <laughs> Well, I mean, again, I can only speak for myself, but I, and, and you know, and I, when I talk to my patients and I, I do a lot of um, dietary surveys, I mean, informally when I, cause it's such a big part of my practice. Mm-hmm. And when I hear what t- people eat, there's a lot of repetition, a lot of repetition. Um, so I, I think an argument can be made that you can actually broaden Right, like people think they're eating a, a larger diversity of foods than they actually are. Right, they're having eggs in the morning. They're having a turkey sandwich, you know, at lunch. They're having a roasted chicken at night. And mm. then they're repeating it like every other day or even every day. Right. Well, let's talk about your patients a little bit. Like, uh, you know, what is the, you, you would kind of mention like the typical things that you see, elevated blood pressure, um, you know, diabetes, obesity, uh, heart disease, things like that. Like, Walk me through some of the success stories that you've had through the, you know, sort of the non-invasive, yeah. uh, you know, dietary counsel that you're giving. Yeah. So, so again, one of the great things about being an internist is that you are looking at all the organ systems and the whole person at once um, from like mental health on down to like their feet, you know, I mean, everything. So when I, there'll be days when I will... I'll have a patient with, 
you know, constipation, um, like just general fatigue, bad sleep, um, high blood pressure, and um, wants to lose weight. Mm-hmm. Like that's basically everybody. And and I'll it's it's kind of one stop shopping in the sense that I will prescribe the same way of eating for all of those conditions, mm-hmm. right? Because all of those things get better with eating a whole food, plant-based diet. Mm-hmm. And so I think some specific examples, um, and, and these are happening all the time, and it's so rewarding to see. I, you know, I'll meet a new patient. I met an, an, this, uh, this gentleman from Mexico um, last December and um, checked his cholesterol. And I think his, his LDL, which is the bad form of cholesterol, was mm-hmm. around 140. And so I called him up and I, you know, I said, Hey, you know, you've got to, got to make some changes and here's what I'd recommend that you do. And I told him to basically cut back on animal products and focus more on plant foods. And I have a speech, I have a way of saying that. And I, you know, I can do it across a bunch of different languages now. And how many languages do you speak? No, I, uh, sorry, I, through the interpreter. <laughs> oh, okay. You have an interpreter. <laughs> No, I speak Spanish and English. Well, what is the general, like, like, like the strategy that you employ to connect? Because people will say, and doctors will say, well, I can tell them to eat better, but they're not going to do it. Like, that's the conventional wisdom, right? Yeah, I have not had that experience at all. I mean, sure, there's, there's lots of people that aren't ready to make changes, but there are lots of people that are and just need, like, they just need support. And they, some of them are, it's as basic as they just need the information. Like, mm-hmm. um, so my strategy is, um, you know, I, I, I kind of follow this motivational interviewing approach, which is a, you know, a, a way of practicing where you're kind of meeting the person where they're at. So that's my first question always is like, do you, are you interested in hearing about some things that you can change in your food choices that might help you feel better? So depending on how interested they are, then I start giving out the information and then I start figuring out like what, you know, I strategize with them, like what are they ready to start working on? And I know there's a whole, you know, when you listen to podcasts and you talk to experts, you know, there's a whole thing in the plant-based community about whether you should take small steps or dive in. And um, that's a really interesting dichotomy to me, but in my reality, I am helping people take small steps because Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not everybody that's ready to dive in. And so maybe one day they will be ready, but for now, even with some small changes, they can start getting benefits. So, so yeah, I'll kind of identify, you know, what are you, here are some things I think you could work on, which one of these broad categories are you ready to start working on? Yeah. And then we kind of take it from there. So I have a bunch of tools and. Right. I think small steps is great because like, if you told people, look, you got to do this completely right now, 100%. And then a week later, they mess up, then they're just going to give up. Right. You know, like, and, it, and if, you're, if you're talking about the goal being sustainability, like give them one thing to master, right. you know, and then let them get on top of that. And then they'll create that connect. Oh, that actually made me feel better. And I'm drinking almond milk now and not, you know, not dairy. And like, I can do it. Right. So then they feel empowered. About, yeah, they right. feel empowered to do the next thing, you know? That is that is the basis of my practice and I've seen it work. Um, I I think the argument for diving right in is also compelling in the sense that, you know, when you when you're in when you're in an environment where you do have a lot of support, like in like in John McDougall's program or something where you're actually like you're immersed, you're in an immersion mm-hmm. situation, people feel so much better so quickly when they transition that um, that might keep them going. But I don't have the I don't have those resources. So for me, this is a more right unless somebody's just hugely internally motivated. Right. And there are those people or their their health is in such disrepair that right. it's that it's really right. critical. Right. But people need a lot of help because I mean as uh, as we all know our our food system and our society does not make it easy for people to make this switch. Mm-hmm. I mean you really have to um, be proactive and aggressive about making the changes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so High cholesterol oh my goes guy. down. Yeah, like, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's just one example. So no, it was it was really great because I, um, you know, I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to crowd. You know, and I I use the crowding out thing a lot. You know, where instead of making it so negative, like stop eating this, stop eating that, I just say, you know, before you're like, can you eat a bowl of you know a bean soup or lentil soup before whatever you would normally eat for dinner, and just start crowding it out gradually. 
So I gave him all that advice. And um, I said, come back in two months and, you know, we'll check your cholesterol. So um, a couple months later, his results came in, like popped up in my computer queue. Mm -hmm. And I looked at them and his LDL was 80. Mm -hmm. So it was one, went from 140 to 80. Yeah, almost in half. And I just thought, and I looked at my note, I like started opening my note to remember what I had done. And I thought, well, which statin did I put him on? Because this is a great response to a statin. You know, mm -hmm. and then I looked at my note and I, I and I realized I hadn't put him on any drugs at all. I was mm. so it was so incredible. Um, not just and that and that he I mean, that was very simple dietary advice. And he he was ready to run with it and did it. Right. Like he did it, though. Like that's the thing. Right. 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 Like he was a, he was a, right. he was a partner in this relationship right. and did the work as if, you know, you're the coach and he's the athlete. Right. Like, you know, the coach can say whatever. But if the athlete doesn't show up for workout it's and there's gonna, and there's a lot of great yeah. reasons why people don't show up for for yeah. their workout. You know, I mean, there's I I take care of people that are, you know, facing like a huge number of barriers, like people that you know, live in the shelter system or um, people that are dealing with, you know, single parent, they're single parents or they're on fixed incomes. And so I feel like my role and what I can best offer to my patients is to be a troubleshooter and to be um, obviously as non-judgmental as I can and um, kind of help them work through it. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings up another important thing, which is, you know, this unfortunate situation that we're in where uh, you know, wellness is kind of being aligned with elitism, you know, and particularly plant-based or being vegan. It's like, oh, well, if you're going to do that, then you're going to be spending all your money at Whole Foods and you're going to be spending all day in the kitchen creating these crazy recipes. And, right. you know, who can afford that and who's got the time? And yet here you are, you know, treating, you know, for the most part, like, you know, an underprivileged community of people who are in dire health and who don't have the means and, and most likely don't have the time to, you know, live that lifestyle. So how do they navigate it? And what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I I actually specifically tell people that you don't have to shop at a like a high end grocery store to get, you know, healthy food. And um, I go as far as and I have a little more time when I'm running my in the obesity clinic setting than I do in my normal um, primary care practice. But I will literally like we'll sit down, we'll go on Google Maps and we'll, we'll just figure stuff out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would love to have like a health coach working with me who could do that. But for now, it's me. And I think the message is that, you know, we can, you know, we can brainstorm this together. And there are definitely always options. Mm -hmm. There are always options. Yeah, it's really similar to what um, Robert Osfeld's doing. Yeah. I'm sure you know. Yeah, Robert. yeah, we're yeah, friends. Yeah, he's great. And yeah, he's now he has those health coaches now because he's created this program. So yeah, I could see you doing something like that. Yeah, I, I can't tell you what it um, how good it feels to be able to connect with people on this level, because when you talk to people about food and lifestyle in general, but when you talk to people about food, you start you have a window into their life that I don't think you really have when you're just saying like, hi, how you doing? I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to get out my prescription pad. And um, are you taking your medicines or not? And it's like very binary. Like this is just an expansive understanding of people and you get to connect with them in a way that you might not otherwise. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's on a super low budget, like what is the, you know, what's the first thing? Like what are the first things you're telling them to go to them? Like are you telling them to buy certain things in bulk or like how does that work? Yeah, I mean, like it's a, it's a cross product of time, money, and access. Right. So, you know, people that have that don't have a lot of money, but have more time have certain options. Mm -hmm. And then we work on the access together because there almost always is access. Mm -hmm. They just don't people don't realize. Um, but if you're limited on time and money, then it gets a little harder. Um, it's still not impossible. Um, people have this perception that like if you can't buy organic like farmers market fruits and vegetables that you shouldn't bother, that it's worse for you to be eating normal. And I, I don't think, I don't think that's true. And I don't think the data support that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I talk to people about, you know, especially in the winter getting frozen, frozen vegetables. Mm -hmm. They're not expensive. They don't go bad. Mm -hmm. Keep them in your freezer and then you don't have an excuse for not putting them on your plate. Um, 
you know, beans and legumes like lentils and chickpeas um, are not only like culturally very applicable for a, a, across a wide range of cultures, but they're obviously pretty cheap, yeah. especially in the dried form. Um, and people are spending people are spending money on things that do, that don't promote health, like soda and Snapple, and obviously, you know, and uh, frozen meals and. Right. Deli sandwich, deli like turkey sandwiches, just McDonald's, Wendy's, and right. whatever, you know whatever. Taco right, Bell. right, and 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 you know obviously those are artificially cheap, and that's another whole conversation um, because of subsidies. But I talk to people about you know just start diverting some of that money, um, and maybe they won't be able to afford the most expensive vegetables out of season, but right. it is progress, and people can make huge strides in their health in terms of mm-hmm. just starting to navigate a little bit. Cool. Pushing the needle. We got to wrap it up here in a few minutes, but there's a couple things I still want to ask you. And I think it would be really helpful for people if you could just leave them with, you know, I don't know, two, three, like really simple, but like powerful, you know, prescriptions for living healthier. Sure. I mean, I think that, I think the number one would be to, um, to, to find the joy in eating in a way and keep yourself open to eating in a way that's sustainable and compassionate and health promoting. So Mm -hmm. I know that's not, that's like at the high level, that's not a practical tip, but that's what drives me. And again, that, um, that I think is the message that I'd like to spread. When you think about eating across the diversity of colors of the rainbow. And that's what I tell my patients a lot too. I think you can get a lot of mileage out of that because, Mm -hmm. you know, if as long as it's not Skittles, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're eating. (laughs) Eat the rainbow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I use that, you know, that PCRM poster (laughs) all the time with people, but that gets you a lot of mileage because if you're doing, if you're doing a diversity of colors and fruits and vegetables in the course of three or four days, you're getting a lot of fruits and vegetables or you're getting more than you were before. Um, Finding, um, you know, focusing on foods that are as, as close to their natural state as possible and foods that come from the ground and from trees. Um, those are the foods that we know promote longevity and reduce disease. Well, these are just all crazy ideas. I mean, <laughs> who, who are you? <laughs> you know, and there's cra- there are crazy uh, ideas out there. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I love, this is, a, this is, by the way, the same message that I give when I give nutrition lectures to doctors, mm-hmm. you know, and you, you can't believe um, some of the ideas that are out there because people have just have not been trained in nutrition at all, mm-hmm. doctors. And so um, it's, a, it's a powerful message and I think it, keeping it simple and yeah. Well, I'm really excited about what you're doing with within the profession, you know, educating other doctors and, and medical professionals. I think that's super powerful. Thank and you. That's exciting. And, uh, you know, more people should be doing that. You know, it's like if the medical schools aren't going to do it, somebody's got to take responsibility for it. Yeah. And the fact that you're yeah. investing in that, I think, is a really a special thing. It's Thank really you. Cool. Um, it's fun. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, at, at the top level, like the first thing that you mentioned, just, you know, Living, living more sustainably, eating more sustainably. I mean, it's just incumbent upon all of us to, uh, you know, really grab that mantle of educating ourselves about where our food comes from, like however you're eating. You know what I mean? Like we deserve to know where our food's coming from. Get interested in that. Learn how to read a nutrition facts label and, you know, find out who these companies are that are producing these foods how they're producing them, how they're shipped and manufactured and packaged and marketed and all of that, because that knowledge is power and that power will help drive your consumer choices. And, you know, a lot of people feel, we feel disenfranchised. You know, Mm -hmm. we feel like we can't make a difference or we just, let's just do what everyone else is doing and live this kind of matrix lifestyle. And it's easy (laughs) to do that. It's easy to do that, you know, and and I did it for most of my life. Right. when you finally say, no, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do what's best for me and I'm going to educate myself and make the right choice for myself. It's incredibly empowering and, and enlightening and it will, it will change your life and it can change the, the life of the people around you and your loved ones in, in doing so. Right. So, well said. Yeah. I mean, it's really powerful. And, you know, I just encourage everybody to go on their own, you know, version of your adventure and, and my mm-hmm. adventure and, and have their own experience with it. Yeah. 
All right, so I'm gonna uh, wrap this up with the final question. It's the same question that I asked Garth at the end. <laughs> so if you listen to that. I did, but I don't remember You don't it. remember? Yeah. Well, you will remember in a moment. <laughs> Uh, if you were Surgeon General, oh. what would you do? What yeah. Would be your oh, I loved change? his answer. I loved his answer. And so, um, well, I don't know that the Surgeon General has the power to do this. Well, let's but just, we're imagining a crazy universe where actually, like, the, the, the this official like actually I can could keep, actually do things. Okay. Yes. Gr- sounds, sounds like a great deal. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. Um, I think the number one thing would be to, um, to, to, stop artificially subsidizing the foods that are least healthy for our for us mm-hmm. right i mean i think that is where the number one driver you know that's one of the first things i would do because people don't realize how much their food should cost um and that doesn't take into account like the healthcare costs that are that stem from those foods. Mm-hmm. So that would be the first thing. Um, Have you read uh, David Simon's book, Meatonomics? It's one of my favorite yeah, yeah. books I've ever read. Yeah. And for people that are listening, I had him on the podcast. It was quite a while ago. I don't remember what episode number it is, but I'll put a link up in the show notes to that. But basically, his whole book is really looks into how subsidies drive, you know, economic. The, the economic machine behind kind of fast food and all of that. So in other words, that, you know, 99 cent McDonald's burger is really like a $7 burger because of everything that goes into it politically. Exactly. And and then there's also the, you know, the stepchild of that is the advertising, you know, the advertising. And so um, that we're actually our taxes are going to advertising for those foods, not just paying at the level of subsidizing the production of the food, but actually paying for the advertisement for that food. So, mm-hmm. you know, you'll be, you know, watching TV and you'll see an ad, you know, you'll see an ad for like a pepperoni cheese pizza. And then the next ad is for, you know, Viagra. And it's like, we can't, <laughs> you know, we really have to start making the connection. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be the first, that would be the first rung. Um and and I think that I would also um, I think that there has to be a way to start educating people about what the healthiest foods are and to mm-hmm. use an evidence based approach because there's a lot of evidence, like I said, for a common consensus. And um, I would use that platform to get the message out in a way that's really clear and get people to understand that, you know, it's not, it may not necessarily be in the headlines Mm -hmm. um, and just have a broad consensus around that. That's a good answer. I think that's a beautiful way to wrap it up. Thank you. So yeah, thanks so much for spending some time with me today. Thank you. Your work is really inspiring and and, uh, I really appreciate what you do. And uh, I hope that you continue to do it And I hope that your work inspires many others to follow in your footsteps. Thank you. So thanks. Likewise. Thanks for for being here. Peace. Plants. Plants.